And for every one of those stories, I bet you, I, even right now, I could probably say, all right, come up, somebody else come up and talk, and I bet you they would. Um, we told you before we left that you uh, Army and so many other things, camps and so many things that, uh, in fact, that's one of our strategies here, trying to get people to get away with, get away, you know, from the world and go, and whether it's serving or camp or whatever, whatever that environment is, we talked about that glow strategy. That's what these guys did. They, they, they left, by, you know, they set their phone aside and they, and, and they got, you know, out of the air conditioning and, and we all, uh, we, we did something that was uncomfortable for us and we hung out with God 24-7 for six days. And, and you can see it on their faces that they are glowing. And, and so I, I will say, I'll start saying it, Mac will be saying it, we'll, we're coming for you next year. We want the 53 that we took this year to be 106 next year or more, right? We, we, every year, we want more and more people to come and experience what it means uh, to serve in the name of Christ, to work with these guys. These guys are inspiring. I'll talk a little bit about this in my message, but I just I want you to know that, that these guys have gifts. Um, these, these guys, uh, some of the stuff that we saw them do this week, the way that they were praying for one another, the way that they were praying, uh, there was a moment when Mac had all the adults come up to the front, all the work team adults and the leadership of the camp, and, and I could see it because I was playing guitar, and I was, I was able to watch what happened. And there were some adults, you know, the, all the students gathered around their work team adults, and they prayed for their particular adults. So let's say there's eight kids, and there's two adults on their site, and they prayed for their work team adults. You know what our Parkway kids did? They went and found, many of them went and found some of the adults who weren't work team adults. They were leadership adults who didn't have kids to pray for them, and they went and prayed for them. I mean... It was powerful. It was just a powerful week. And these guys, um, they, they, I bet you they, some of them surprised themselves. Um, but, but God used them in some powerful ways. And so I want you to hear from me. I know Max already said this. I'm proud of you. Um, we, as a congregation, are proud of you, of the work that you did. And we, we are thankful that you went and you, you worked in some of the places that most of us don't want to drive through. You guys spent a week there. And, and you love people, and you reminded them that the God of the universe has not forgotten them, and that the people of God have not forgotten them. So thank you for the work that you did this week. Will you guys just one more time, let's just thank God for what they did. We're coming for you next year. So... Um, you know, we're continuing our, our, uh, our message series on the Acts of the Apostles and what that means for the modern church. And so we're going to talk some about, uh, some about kind of what we saw these guys do. The idea of recovering our sentness is what we're really going to be talking about this morning. And I want to invite you to hear um, about a church right in the ancient world, a church in a place called Antioch, and how their willingness to understand their own giftedness and their willingness to be sent how it changed the world, and then what does that mean for us? So here we go. Um, so again, this is uh, Acts chapter 13, starting in verse 1. Now in the church at Antioch, there were prophets and teachers, Barnabas, Simeon called Niger, Lucius of Cyrene, Manaen, who had been brought up with Herod the Tetrarch, and Saul, the same Saul we talked about last week that God changed and, uh, and, and used in so many powerful ways. While they were worshiping the Lord and fasting, the Holy Spirit said, Set apart for me Barnabas and Saul for the work to which I have called them. So after they had fasted and prayed, they placed their hands on them and sent them off. The two of them, sent on their way by the Holy Spirit, went down to Seleucia and sailed from there to Cyprus. When they arrived at Salamis, they proclaimed the word of God in the Jewish synagogue. John was with them as their helper. Can you pray with me? God, thank you so much for this day, and I thank you for these friends. I thank you for this time when we can hear from you. God, I'm thankful for your word that still speaks today. God, I pray that you would uh, use your word to speak today. I pray you would either use me now to speak a word, or you'd set me aside and speak a word in spite of me. Either way, God, we know that uh, we're not, we, nobody came here to hear me, that we came uh, to be taught by your Holy Spirit, and that's what we're asking, and that's what we're trusting in Jesus' name, amen. So this church in Antioch, uh, you know, that may just seem like, okay, just kind of a random throwaway story in the book of Acts, but actually, uh, all of, really, the movement of the gospel 
from the Jews to the Gentiles, in so many ways you can pinpoint it, it, it starts right here. This church at Antioch is really the first place where, where God intentionally uh, sends people from a particular group of people out uh, to go and then begin to spread the gospel to the Gentiles. The fact that you and I are here in this place, the fact that there are two billion-ish Christians around the world, all of it can be, can be pinpointed. It all comes back to this place in Scripture, this particular church, probably smaller. I am certain it was smaller than the number of people that are in this room right now. Certainly it is, it is smaller than the, than the two services that we have. I mean, these people were meeting in houses. They didn't have buildings. The church in Antioch was probably not some huge uh, you know, group of people. It was just uh, it was a, it was a fledgling uh, group of people. And, and from this church, you can begin to see the movement of God from one particular group of Jews in the ancient world to the rest of the world. A, 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 a takeover of the entire Roman world without a shot being fired. A love revolution. And it all stems back to this place. So this week when we were at UM Army, I was, I was like, you know, I mean, it's pretty cool to think of churches having group giftings. You, you heard here at the beginning of this scripture, it says, now in the church at Antioch, there were prophets and teachers, and it names five prophets and teachers, one of which was Barnabas and one was Saul, and those were the two that eventually get sent out to begin this expansion into the Gentile world. So in the, in the church at Antioch, there were, there were prophets and teachers. It's pretty cool to think of this idea of group giftings. That a church, you know, that, that, that God is like, God took an inventory of the people of Antioch and said, you know, there's some, there's some pro- we got a bunch of prophets and teachers here. And so I'm going to utilize what it is that God has, is already doing here. I'm going to send some of, those, uh, some of those prophets and teachers and I'm going to send them out into the world. And so this week I was thinking to myself, I wonder what the group gifting of the people of Parkway was. So that was kind of the eyes with which I was looking at the world as I went to UM Army this week. Now, I, to just give you some um, background, at the be- Ginger was the safety person this week, and she, she uh, introduced at the beginning of the week this, this stuffed animal beanbag shark. It was called Simon the Safety Shark. I know it sounds cheesy, but it gets better. So, so Simon the Safety Shark was meant to be given to the team of the, we- uh, of the day who was the safest on their site, right? It was meant to encourage uh, safety on the site. It was a great. It was a great idea. This is something that Parkway's been doing for a long time. This sort of, you know, stuffed animal thing, right? So she, this year, it was Simon the Safety Shark. Now Simon the Safety Shark again, just helping us think through safety. But Simon the Safety Shark, um, as I, as we watch the progression of Simon the Safety Shark over the we, over the course of the week, a couple of things happened to Simon. One of the things that happened to Simon was that Simon began to be borrowed, shall we say. And it may or may not be so that your pastor happened to be one of the borrowers of the shark. It may or may not be so that uh, there was a particular group that was not particularly taking and paying close enough attention to Simon the Safety Shark. And so a certain, a certain Percival, not the associate pastor one, but her husband, uh, and I launched a plan. This group, they kept leaving Simon the safety shark on the table. Now, I know you're like, how does this have to do with group gifting? Stay with me. So, so they kept leaving Simon on the table, and so when they got called up for an award, he and I said, if they leave that shark on the table one more time, it's on. So they get called up for an, another award. That was, they had two awards, and so it may or may not be so that I ran up to the table, took the shark, threw him over my shoulder as far as I could, Eric grabbed him and ran into the, other, into the other room. I sat right back down like I had no idea what just happened. They're like, what happened to our shark? I said, I don't know. I've been sitting here the whole time. I don't, I don't have your shark. And, and that began the movement of the shark throughout the week being borrowed, is what we call it. Now, as the shark went on, not only did the shark get borrowed a few times between groups, but also the shark received some modifications. Um, First, the shark had some stuff written in his mouth. Then the shark was painted red and green, half. Um, then the shark was sunk into a box, like a two-by-two two framed box full of concrete. And then, I mean, he was, his head was still sticking out. Do we have the picture of that? You can, you can at least see him. And then, there he is. He's sticking out of the concrete. He has a safety mask on. He is the safety shark, after all. They painted the concrete blue. They painted the box blue. And you can see there's a chain. You know why there's a chain? Because 
um, it, it, because a, a particular uh, person uh, from this congregation uh, whose name, I, I don't want to mention his name because I'm afraid he'll change something to my bumper, um, but he chained the, the, uh, the shark in the box with now the casters on the wheel to somebody's truck. His name uh, rhymes with uh, um, Gnarl's pie chart, but, um, but, um, but he, so, so that happened, and then the person who's, uh, to, whose, to whose bumper he chained the shark you know, Charles did that. Sorry, I just said his name. I just said his name. Oh my gosh. Oh my gosh. I'm going to go out in the parking lot and something's going to be chained to my bumper. All right. All right, Charles. Um, so, anyway, so they, so they found out that he did it. He did it at 1 o'clock. They came back at 3 o'clock and they, um, they then took his, they took the safety shark and they put it on his bumper uh, and chained it. And then they also put post it notes all over his truck and saran wrapped his entire truck shut. Now, friends, Friday, or I guess it was yesterday, I woke up in a cold sweat. And I said to myself, I now know what the group gifting of Parkway is. It's petty thievery <laughs> and constructive vandalism. We, we have a gift, Parkway, that we have to offer to the kingdom. And no, we don't. But I was, I was thinking this week, what are the gifts that we have? Like, what has God given us that He wants us to use, right? It's not just us as individuals, but what do we as individuals bring to the group? And then what does God want to unleash on the world? Just as this, this, this church, this church in Antioch, they realized that they had teachers and prophets. God took inventory of them, and they were willing to listen to what God had said. And God said to them, through the Holy Spirit, God said, Look, I want you to set aside two of them. There were five that they named, but they said, God said, I want to set, two, set aside two of them, and I want you to send them into the world. And as I said, this church at Antioch is the reason that you're sitting here today. It's because God, um, obviously God was already doing some things, but the very intentional, specific effort to, to bring the Gospel to the Gentile world really strategically starts here. So what is it? If, if this sentence didn't start uh, you know, in the church at Antioch, there were teachers and prophets, how would it have started if, if it started with this phrase? What if, what if the Scriptures included Parkway in the first verse of Acts chapter 13? What if, what if it said, in the church at Parkway, there were, and then you had to fill in the blank. Like, when God looks at us, as a group of individuals who are gathered as a family, what, what do you think he sees? How, what does his inventory of us look like? Right? What, what is it that he says? That, that when he looks at us, does he say, in the church at Parkway, there were or there are many teachers, um, bankers, uh, managers, stay-at-home moms, dads, homeschoolers, like when God looks at us, what does He say? Like what inventory does He take of us as He looks at the kinds of things that we could do for the kingdom in the world? Does He say, hey, there's a group of people at Parkway, they have a heart for comp of compassion, they have a heart of mercy, they have a heart to make a difference in the world, they have a heart to unleash people to go and build wheelchair ramps and sit with lonely people who sit by themselves uh, you know, in the middle of a heat wave, they sit inside their unair conditioned homes. What does God say when He looks at Parkway and He and He thinks about our group gifting? I believe that there are group giftings. I didn't ever think about that as a kid, but when I became a pastor, I began to see it. I began to see that it it in operation that 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 there are group giftings that that God does put us in a particular place. I believe that God, and I know you believe that God has put us here for a reason. There's a reason we're not in some other place. There's a reason we're not in Richmond or Rosenberg on the other side of Sugar Land. There's a reason that we're right here. And the reason is because God's planted us here to do something right around where we are. But He's also given us not just a particular place, He's given us a particular people, and that's you, and that's me. And he's given us group giftings to make a difference in the world. Now, for us to be able to understand what our group giftings are, you know what we have to do? To, to understand our group gifting as a church and to understand that it's more than just petty thievery and constructive vandalism, to understand what our group giftings are, we have to understand our individual giftings. 
So I want to ask you a question this morning. What is it? When God takes inventory of you as an individual, what, what does He say about you? What does He say? You know, I wove that person together to do this. What does He say about your gifts? What does He say about your skills? What does He say about your strengths and maybe even your weaknesses? What does He say about your passions? Friends, what, whatever it is that God does when He looks at you and He speaks of your inventory of your gifts and skills and strengths and passions, whatever that is, you need to know that if you and I are going to serve in the world, and certainly if we're going to have the kind of impact that this church at Antioch had, if we're going to have that sort of impact, friends, we have got to know our individual gifts. Our individual giftings, not just our corporate gifting. Well, what does he say when he, says, when he sees you? Does he say, you know, in that person, I really placed a desire to help people. In that person, I created a great listener in that person i made a great cook in that person i made someone who is uh, who is really good at building stuff which we could have used on some sites this week in that person i i placed a heart of compassion in that person i placed someone who just is willing right they may not be maybe they're not great at any particular thing but they're just willing to go wherever i sent them friends what does god see when he looks at you what does he say are your group gifts i mean your individual gifts uh, this was and again this is another um army example and i'm sorry but that's what i ate and bra breathed and drank all week long was um army so this week i told you ginger was the safety coordinator and um and she took that very seriously uh, and and for the the since the moment she knew she was doing safety, she began to worry this is what this is her spiritual gift by the way she began to worry about the 140 people that she believed from that moment on were in her care for safety and so she worried about it, and she prayed about it, and she Googled it. You know, she, how, do I, how do I keep people safe on a work team? She looked for other ideas. She bought a safety shark. I mean, she did all this kind of stuff. Because she, from the moment she understood that that was her job, she began to operate out of her giftedness. Now, I didn't really recognize that at first, but when I heard somebody ask her at the end of the week, did you have a good time? You know, did you, did you really enjoy your experience at UM Army? And I don't think she said this to me. I think she said it to somebody else. But I overheard her say these words. She said, yes, I had a great time. And she said, because it allowed me to mother 140 people. And in that moment, friends, I completely got it in a way that I didn't know before. As I watched her all week, I just said, she's kind of like, she's like really into this. She's like glowing. She's doing some amazing, she's doing a really great job. But I didn't understand. I couldn't put words to it until I heard her put words to it. She was mothering a group of 140 people. If you know Ginger at all, if you see her around children at all, if you see her around students at all, she, that is what she believes she was put on this planet to do. That's what she, that she believes, that is her highest calling is to, is to mother our kids and to mother other people's kids and to just, she, that's just what she, that's what she loves to do. That's what she's passionate about doing. It's what she's good at. She's good at some other things, but that was... And so this week, as I watched her, I finally, when she said that out loud, I realized that's why she was glowing. That's why she was doing such a great job, because that's what she was passionate about. That's what God has placed her here to do. And it just so happened that she fell into a place where she was operating out of her giftedness. But friends, what I also realized when she said that out loud was that she knew it. She knew what her gifting was. And she knew that she was doing what she loved to do friends if you and i are going to have the kind of impact on the world that we want to have if we're going to have the kind of impact as a church on the community that we know that god wants us to have if we want to be able to uh, to to have a group a gifting and have that impact the world you and i have to know that we have to have that sort of knowledge of ourselves we have to we have to be able to say god what what passions did you give me what am i good at like, what did, you, what did you weave me together in the womb to do? What have you called me out to do? And so I, I want to ask you again, what do you think God says of you when He looks at you? I gave you compassion. I, I made you a musician. I gave you um, words. You're good at writing. You're good at speaking. You're, you're, you're kind. You're, you're a great listener. You have resources. Maybe it's financial resources. Maybe it's... Maybe it's um, just kind of 
you know, people skills. I, I don't know what it is that God has given you, but I know that He has done it for a reason. He did not just give us the things that we have just for us. He did not just give us the skills that we have just to use them with our friends and our family friends. God wants to send us out and to change the world. We went into some places this week that need the love and the mercy of Christ there. And you don't have to go to the third ward, by the way, to find that. You can go across the street and down the street. You can go to your workplace. You can sit and watch it at your school. Friends, the world that we live in needs Christ. And if we want to have an impact on this world, we not only have to understand what God has done in in our midst as a group, but, but in order to do that, we have to understand who we are. So ask God, God, who have you made me to be? What is it that I am good at? And God, how can I use that skill? How can I use that spiritual gift? How can I use that strength? How can I use my willingness How can I use my weakness, Father, to bless You? And friends, if we start asking that question, if we start getting clear on who God has made us to be, it's going to multiply our impact. We see what happens. We don't have to worry or wonder what's going to happen. We see what happens. God unleashed the Gospel on the world through one church at Antioch that had an abundance of teachers and prophets who understood their giftedness and and who understood their group giftings and were willing to put those at the disposal of the Holy Spirit and the Holy Spirit said, go. And they went. The last question I have for you, and it's the simplest question, but it's the hardest question, is the question of once you know your individual gifts and as we come to know our group gifting, This is the most important question. And it's the hardest question. Will you go? Are you willing to be sent? Are you willing to take what you have, to take who you are and put it at the disposal of Christ? When God says, go out in the heat and build a wheelchair ramp and work six days from 8.30 in the morning till 4 or 5 or one of our groups on Friday worked till 6 in 99 degree heat with a heat index I'm sure over 110. Are you willing to be sent? But when He sends you to go and pray for somebody, when He sends you to go to listen to somebody, when He sends you to share your faith openly, when He, share, when he sends you just to listen to somebody's questions, when He sends you to adopt or to foster, like I, When He sends you, are you willing to be sent? It's one thing to know your individual gifts and skills. It's one thing for us to know our group gifting as a church. But the most important question, the thing that unleashes those gifts on the world is the answer to the last question, which is, will you be sent? Will you go? Friends, if we want to have the kind of impact that Antioch had, that is a crucial question. Yeah, do we know our group gifting? That's important. And for us to know that, you've got to know your own gifts and skills and strengths and passions and even your weaknesses. But at the end of the day, even beyond that, we have to be willing to just be sent. We have to recover from the early church that desire, that willingness to be sent. We have to recover our sentness. If we do, we see what happens. Maybe it's a huge impact on this beautifully diverse community we live in. Maybe it's an impact to the city of Houston that surrounds us. Maybe it's an impact to our region or our state or our country. Or as these people did, maybe it's an impact on our world. Let's put nothing past God. And let's just, let's just look to the early church. Let's get to know our gifts. Let's get to know our group gifting, and more than, more than anything else, friends, let's put our gifts at God's disposal and say, here I am. Send me. Let us recover our sentness. Will you go?